and Executive <laughs> Director Donna Markser. Oh, Woody Allen said mime should be made a capital offense, but I think wearing backpacks should. Sorry, folks. Yeah. Um, welcome to Artists Talk on Art. This is a wonderful evening. We have a real star here, too, as a matter of fact. Um, I have to uh, thank the Phoenix Gallery, and who always lets us have this free space, and I don't have to thank them. I'm willing to. We're willing to. Please be careful of the sculpture. We can't move it anymore, and we did have to buy a piece last year, so these are more expensive. So, um, you know, please be careful swinging your coats around in your exuberance. Thank you. Uh, I, I need, first of all, to tell you about next week, um, February 18th. We will be having an evening. We often celebrate different media. And next week, it'll be older media, cloth, wax, paper, and fresco, used in the new ways of the 90s. It should be an interesting evening. I'm going to be the moderator, lightly moderating. So please come if you can. Um, how many of you are pass holders? Oh, so few. So few. Uh, for $40 a year regular pass, 30 for senior or student, you can be a pass holder and be eligible for group health insurance. Our calendar explains all, or you can call us at our number. Please use our telephone number. It's printed, uh, it's in the phone book, and it's printed in our calendar. Please call us. For one thing, sometimes we do have to change programs at the last minute. We can't help it. People get the flu, they get cold feet, whatever. And we have to make substitutions or we have to change whole programs sometimes. It does happen. So please call our number and double check. There's always a message on and I do call you back uh, once, you know, I check in at least once a day and I do call back. Um, now. February 23rd, we are having a program meeting at my loft across the street, and it's announced in the calendar. Uh, we need volunteers. We need people to help with programming. Uh, we, it's, it's really fun. We have a mailing party for the whole month, and um, we, uh, we got a little grant to send extra flyers out. It's paying off, as you can see. And, um, uh, it's a lot of fun, and I make soup for everybody, which I'm a good soup maker. I'm soup goddess, as a matter of fact. I'm famous for it. Uh, well, okay, that's enough about, enough about me. <laughs> she is good at making soup. Yes. I've had it. Okay. my favorite. Yeah, okay, you're getting split pea this time, I think. Uh, anyway, I that one. <laughs> maybe not, you know, if you're persuasive. You're good, really good tonight, you get your choice. Uh, Jason Andrew is a wonderful guy. He's about our, to uh, uh, join our board of directors. He's a painter, an artist in his own right. He's um, an independent curator. He is currently working uh, as, as a dealer on 66th on Street. 66th Street. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Utah, which is famous for Orrin Hatch, early dropout. Um, he has been a director of the Reese Gallery. He has worked for Jeff Koons. Last year, he just gave a dynamite evening with Robert Natkin, uh, who I lovingly call my favorite windbag. And, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and um, he's, a, uh, the friend of, he's a friend of the stars, and he's going to introduce tonight's star. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. All right. This is on, right? This is on. Can you hear me? Okay. It's a small room. What's that? It's a small room. <laughs> Before I um, even went to college to study art, I came across Larry Poon's work and basically all of the almanacs of art, the history of art, the 1960s. You know, it was, and so it's quite an honor to be here with Larry tonight, sitting with him, and I've been able to, over the past year, work with him on an individual basis and get to see his work. I've gone up to see him in process, which is quite a process. I mean, it's sort of, he re, what do you want to call it? He, he, he redefines the word process, which is quite exciting, quite exciting, especially for someone who likes to paint and likes to see color. And um, so, good evening, Larry. Good evening. 
And I would like to, to start off, I, I wrote some things down that I wanted to say because I didn't want to miss anything, but I'm bound to miss stuff. And I want to just give a basic um, starting point of history for, so I've prepared a, by way of just simple introduction. <clears throat> Larry Poons has challenged how we perceive color, texture, form, and composition from his early optical dot paintings to the organic compositions of the 70s and 80s to his current vistas. Larry has provided the art world with an exciting and historic aesthetic trip. That's what I like to define it. I believe it's the passion in his color and his well-oriented placement of forms that has paced his, his paintings or his, and his pictures beyond uh, the best of Barnett Newman and the gestures of Jackson Pollock and the ryth um, rhythms of Pete Mondrian. Um, from his first exhibition, public exhibition in 1963 to the present, his work has been included in hundreds of solo exhibitions. He's been represented by the Green Gallery, the Leo Castelli Gallery, Lawrence Rubin Gallery, Nodler, Andre Emmerich, and he currently shows, I think, as everyone knows, with Sound O'Reilly. And a new person to the list is Theo Waddington Farnart, so we're hoping that that works in March. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, He's been the subject of numerous articles, reviews, and documentaries, and who can forget Larry painting in the film, Painter's Painting. Um, his pictures can be found in major collections around the world, from the Tate Gallery in London to one of my newfound favorites, the Hunter Museum of American Art in, Ch in, in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. All right. From the Los Angeles County Museum of Art to our very own Guggenheim, the Met, the MoMA, the Whitney, and uh, of course the Brooklyn Museum. As, men, as, as far as many others, many. <clears throat> he's been the instructor at the, uh, he's instructed on art at the, the New York School sc uh, Studio School, the Cooper Union, and Bennington College. And he's been a guest artist uh, lecturer at the Brooklyn College, Yale University, to name just a few. Um, and he currently teaches painting at the Art Students League. So if that's not enough, there's a, this, you're hearing this first here. There is an unpublished, um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm breaking oath here by doing this, but there's an unpublished writing on um, Larry by Frank Stella. It was a, it was, he was asked to write, on a, um, to write an introduction to a catalog that was to be opening a, a retrospective of his work that hence has been postponed. Um, and it tops it off very nicely. He says, in our time, no one has extended or expanded the range of pictorial expression more than Larry Poons. It's enough, certainly, to make him a hero of our time, which I think is very well written. It's a very wonderful thing, and I hope that it becomes published and becomes public. So again, I'm certain that I have overlooked a aspects, but it's sort of difficult to, cap to capsulate Larry's art because it doesn't call for that. So that's Larry Poons. It doesn't call for what? Well, for the, for, it to, for the art to be contained, the art is very, it's open, it's explosive, it doesn't have boundaries. Mm. That's what I mean by that. <laughs> That's what I mean by that. Like carpeting. Like carpeting? Wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. <laughs> okay. Um, so, we're sort of going to break a little bit of form um, with Artist Talk on Art. I know that we like to keep a lot of things, um, uh, we like to keep everything documented with, the, with the video. But if anyone has a question during the process of us talking, I think a lot of people know his work. Yeah, let's feel like we're in a living room. Yeah. You know? We're going to, you can ask a question and, and I'll be happy to reiterate the question so that it's on film. And then I'll, so um, if there's anyone that has a question about sizes or lengths. Or, or anything, heights, we all sign releases for stupidity when we walk through the door. <laughs> I had you know. someone else sign that for me. Yeah, I mean, just, just take it for granted, you know. Sure, Anything, sure. you know, just say or ask anything. But what I'm prepared to do, and I think I'll try this, to. this is okay, I wanted to start at the beginning, or somewhere near the beginning. And um, so I think we should just, we should go on to the slides. I think we should just start there. It, it'll give me something to start with. Well, this is your slideshow. This is yeah. my slideshow? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So... Let's, um, this is the button, right? Okay. Yeah, we get turned on first. Oh. Okay. That's the word, that's, I thought you were gonna start at the beginning. I'm starting at the beginning, but this was just a prelude. This is a taste. A prelude. Yes. 
This is a recent work called uh, Compression Sisters. The Compression Sisters. The Compression Sisters. Right. And this is where Larry used to live. This is where he grew up in, in Great Neck. <laughs> no, this is just a, this is just a, we're moving on to the next thing. All right. So, Larry, you left the, the New England Conservatory of Music to study art in the fall of 1956. And what, my question is, what drew you away from one passion and into the next passion, which has become art? Well, it was, you might, it was, it was like a kind of like, just like any, anyone else, you know, like we don't start off doing usually what we end up doing or want to do. I kind of knew I wanted to be an artist, but what, you know, maybe a poet, maybe a novelist, maybe a musician. And uh, I think uh, if, you, if you're lucky enough or, or stumble enough, you end up doing what you're best at. Whatever it might be, like Willie Sutton, Rob Banks, he was good at it. You know? I just found I mean, that out. I, I don't mean. To be, I just found know. that out that he robbed banks at the loft the other day. Yeah. But I mean, me. uh, you know, in general, I've begun to think if people just did what they do best, it would kind of be better for the world at large and for all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> you know, rather than have the girl in the subway throw the token back at you, you know. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, I couldn't write music the way I felt I should be writing music, you know? I had to ask too many questions. I, it didn't come as natural to me as my instinct told me, hey, if you're going to be, if you're going to be like the William Butler Yeats of something, right, uh -huh. it shouldn't be this, it shouldn't, it should come a little bit more natural to you than like sitting down and saying, well, I'd love to write a symphony, but where the hell do I start? You know, uh, it wasn't coming. Uh, with painting, which I started probably in high school, uh, it, gradually, uh, it gradually became apparent to me that I knew what I was doing and I didn't have so many questions about what I was doing or why I was doing. It, was, it felt more natural to me. I knew what I was doing in a way that I didn't when I was writing the kind of music I wanted to write or trying to write, so. Um, thanks. Let's, let's talk about some early influences. And we've got Theo Van Dosburg. This is... Um, well, the really earliest influence was like Tex Ritter and, uh, and Hank Williams and uh, Hank Snow. I mean, though, those were the first people in the... Or Al Jolson. You know, I mean, that was the first stuff that got me into, like, feeling good, you know, okay. and, like, led me into poetry and led me into art, you know, it just sort of, like, uh, came natural. Uh, hell, if, the, if I could sing as good as I paint, I, I'd be in Nashville now, hopefully, you know? Hopefully. Yeah. So this is um, counter-composition. Oh, Theo von Dosberg. Yeah. Yeah. Who a lot of people don't know about. Theo von Dosberg was a compatriot of Mondrian's. Certainly. They kind of Certainly. worked at the same time. And can you go back to the Dosberg? Yeah, let's go back. I haven't even, I've never, I've never ever seen this. This is the real counter composition. This is it. This is the simultaneous counter composition. You see, what he did, you know, like Mondrian was going like this all the time. Dosberg went off on the diagonal, uh, which, right from the very moment where I think I first saw this in high school, I was attracted to it. You know, I mean, not that it supplanted Mondrian. It didn't supplant, you know, I just like this too, you know. And uh, when I started painting the dots, you know, they started, you know, you know little circles and they kind of always look straight ahead at you. And then when I wanted some movement, of course it was diagonal movement, you know, with ellipses that point left or right, you know. And there's the influence to that. It was the diagonals of uh, Dosberg, yeah. And of course he also did some long, thin freezes. Certainly, know, w you know, with with sharp angles and. But those are hard to those are hard to understand. Those are what hard. What do you mean understand? Well, they're hard to understand. Out. Well, you've, what you've got is I have a vocabulary where I can go and do some research, and unfortunately, because those pi those pictures are difficult for the public, for people to be able to go see in museums, they're not comforting. They're a little Von bit Dosberg? difficult. Certainly. Oh, and he's, he's not, not famous at all. Well, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. He's not. 
no one picks up on his name, yeah. which is sort of the well, way the art world works. You know, it's just his paintings, you know, were, I like his paintings better than Glarner's. Certainly. Yeah. So this is Broadway Boogie Woogie. Everyone has pretty much seen this. It's very stable. Mondrian but yet loved, dynamic at the same time. Mondrian Movement. loved to dance. He was a, a jitterbugger, sure. you know, like during the war. <clears throat> and another part of Pete Mondrian was that when he was in Holland, he'd, he'd make some paintings he didn't like. He used to take them out in the backyard and shoot them with a pistol. <laughs> 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 well, don't ask me how I know this. You just go to the library and you can find this stuff. And I did when I was in... Uh, in art school up in Boston, yeah, yeah. which shows you, you know, he wasn't the staid old, you know, fuddy-duddy that art schools try to lay on you because his paintings look a certain way, you know. I mean, my God, you know, Jackson Pollock could just as well have been a priest and made those pictures. You know, the fact that he had desultory habits, well, so does a lot of truck drivers. That doesn't make him Jackson Pollock, you know. <laughs> you know uh, People confuse things with things. They confuse what a painting looks like for a kind of individual or human being. It could be anybody. You know, which gets back to the kind of thing I guess I'm getting at. It really doesn't matter who you are when it comes to art. What matters is your art. Contrary to a lot of opinions around today that what comes out of your damn mouth is more important than what you look at and what your art looks like. I mean, if it made sense to be that way, it would be great, but it just doesn't make sense. So, so why are so many people like that today? I don't know. Maybe because it makes it easier. You know? Mm -hmm. So following a passion, you, you, left, you left art school, and then you came back to New York, right? I left, left art Boston. school because in art school, I went and saw a show of Stuart Davis. Certainly, museum, and I've read that you and were... And I human, brought it yeah. back. I brought the catalog back, and my painting teacher started telling me he, he wasn't a painter, he was just a, uh, a designer oh, he must, or he something. Must, he must paint his pictures looking at a TV set, was their great uh, thing, you know, because like he used like kind of some rounded uh, oblong shapes that you might say look like a TV set. Yeah. And my painting teachers thought Mondrian was just a designer. Certainly. You know, so it wasn't such a hot atmosphere. Uh, and you could learn more on your you could learn more on your own. You could learn more leaving school, coming back and experiencing it firsthand. Well, I had a you knew what you liked. I used well, you to knew dress what you liked. like a slob. You know, I, I you guess, used to. You know, I, you know, it's always like, yeah. you know, and I I was making these Mondrian kind of paintings. Certainly. And this guy who taught there knew Mondrian from Holland. He brought me into his and I, I had a picture in a student exhibition. You know, diamond was a nail plastic painting. And I got a lecture from the guy how I c couldn't paint this way because when he visited Mondrian, Mondrian dressed in a suit, he had a grand piano. When he talked, he just moved a little matchbook around the table. You know, everything was precise. You know, and I'm listening to this guy and, and I get, the, get his message. He's saying, you can't paint this way. Look yeah. what a slob you are, uh -huh. right? <laughs> I guess he didn't know about Mondrian shooting his paintings in his backyard. Or, or, Mondrian, or Mondrian using tape to, to make the, the, the straight edges, you know, make them... Not to make straight edges, try to find out where they might go so we could paint the damn things and then change them again. <laughs> An again, yeah. another, another... Yeah. And you opened a coffee shop in, at Bleecker Street. Uh, with some uh, painter friends mm -hmm. of mine. It was called Epitome, right? Yeah, with a kind of guy who was my mentor. Sure. A guy named Don Macri who was a painter and another painter, Howard Smythe, the three of us. Uh, and Jack Kerouac um, read poetry there, Ray Brimster. And, yeah, all those guys. Know, yeah, we were one of the Gregory two Crusoe. coffee houses, right, that yeah. did that stuff. Must have been a good time. It was lively. Yeah. It was good. Yeah, it was sure, good. sure. Yeah. Because, you know, <clears throat> yeah, it just was. And then, um, so tell us about the exhibition at French and Company in the March of 1959. And oh, Howard came and said, you got to go see yeah, this painting was in it. You got to go see this show, and I went and saw that show, and well, I'd never seen anything like this. You can see how my interest in Mondrian got picked up immediately by by this Barnett Newman. You know, that's a very large painting, even by today's standards, a beautiful painting. And uh, I mean, there was just room. You know, there's rooms full of these. You know. 
absolutely, well, you know, it was like, uh, it was like maybe the first time that Wagner or Beethoven got to you, you know? It, it, I mean, it was that kind of moment, you know, uh, when I first, you know, I mean, and so you this thought it was for me. And so you thought no, you it was for me. It was yeah. just like wow, listen yeah. to that. And you, you thought, know? well, you, I have to meet this guy. I didn't feel I had to meet him. He became accessible because of a Newsweek article, right. and they and dropped wrote, his address. So and, I wrote him a note. And thanks to the, I went to the Barnett Newman Foundation. We got a copy of this letter. And My God! If you want to read it, I can read it if you if you, if you want me to read it. <laughs> but anyway, he writes this letter to Barnett Newman, and Barnett Newman, of course, everyone knows parts of the story. He, he said, you know, after a month of sending this letter, he gives Larry a call and wants Larry to come and to a party, I guess, right? Or yeah. something? Yeah, Let me read this letter, because it's very, it's, anybody? it's very Larry, it's very to the point. It's just, Mr. Newman, I'm a young painter who would like to meet you, who would like very much to meet you. I can be reached during the day until 3 o'clock at at CH26487 during the night at GR59141. Sincerely, Larry Poons. It's very nice. Yeah, so he was having this party and he invited me to the party. And there's a whole bunch of people there. I remember Will Barnett was there. And he invited me to stay after the party. And we sat around, we were drinking, and he, he was half a composer as well. So we sat around at piano and he's playing some of his stuff. And just had a good time. Yeah, yeah. So let's move to Art of the Fugue. I wasn't able to get any slides of this. Well, I haven't the, seen Art of the, the Fugue. Catalog. Well, I well I've yeah. seen that, but I haven't seen them in person. The Art of the Fugue was a, an early series, some correct? Some English collector has that. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> I gave and it to some English people, and then they died, and this guy picked it up from their collection. I forget his name. Yeah, yeah it's a nice picture. Yeah, Art of the Fugue was it had. Uh, Sort of, it started to have this progression. It showed progression. It showed movement of forms of geometri geometric abstractions. Very, it was very geometric. Well, it was based on a series of, you know, if you divide a square up into eight by eight, you've got 64 squares. And if you take a circle through eight stages of like one eight, two eights, three eights, four eights, five eights, six eights, seven eights, eight eights, eight eights right? You've got a full circle at the top. You know, it's like theme and variations. You know, it starts on one side, comes down the other like this, and then it gets tilted over, and the same thing happens again. And then, you know, you 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 kind of put colors where you know to match the you know the different stages of what you know you're you're relating to, and it all worked and came to be a painting. That's it's called art of the And then you moved on to, of course, dots. I didn't move on to it just like that. I. Had a, a good friend, you know who, uh, Ray Johnson. It's a dirty slide, so. Ray Johnson and I, uh, I pal around with Ray, and you know he knew about paintings, and he'd come to my studio and look at paintings, and I had a whole bunch of Ray different Johnson, kinds right? of yeah, different kinds of paintings, and one of them was this dot picture that I made. <laughs> yeah, I was making jagged things, connecting points. You know, if you connect, if you move as a circle, a little dot. You take a dot and move it eight points around a square, you're back to the 64 again, that I described to you before, right? But if you connect the lines, if you connect the dots, the straight lines, you end up with this kind of jagged lightning looking shapes, right? And I painted some of them, and I didn't like the way they looked. So I decided just to paint the points. So I had this like first dot picture, I didn't call it that where I just painted the points. And when Ray came in and looked at everything, he says, oh, look at that. Ooh, well, I mean, what more need be said? Of course, I was going to do another one. And, you know. This is called Night on, on Cold Mountain. And it's uh, the title, the, the title, what I understand, the title is derived from the 100 poems by Chinese poet. Han San. Han San. The Cold Mountain poems. And of course, we know Cold Mountain from probably Br uh, Bryce Martin has done a series not as good, but earlier. There's a, there's, Han San was an ancient Chinese poet who, with a buddy of his, went and lived on a mountain. And uh, you scratch his, as, as it goes, you scratch his poems in rocks. And the mountain was called Cold Mountain, and the poems were gotten off rocks, I guess, or stuff like that a long time ago. Mm. And he lived on Cold Mountain. 
This is called double speed. It's 1960, we're 1962, 1963. Yeah, Jody Nicholas, a motorcycle racer, he led the race up in Loudoun, New Hampshire, the entire race, and on the last lap he fell down. He picked up the motorcycle, he got passed, and in one lap, repassed the person who passed him and still won the race. So I named the painting after him and called it Jody's uh, Double Speed. Uh, yeah. And here we go on to, this is Cherry Smash. Yeah, this was a gift to Henry Gutzall. That was his uh, first one. Yeah. What and those, the, those blue dots, just they just glow. I mean, it's, it's amazing. There's it's amazing. a make to it in black and white. Mm -hmm. it was two, yeah. Oh, you want to know the size? This is 56 by 56. And it has a mate which is black and white. Mm -hmm. They've never been shown together. One day they will be. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is Orange Crush. It's 80 by 80, 80 inches by 80 inches. What year were these? Uh, this is 1963. Yeah, these are big paintings, even by. This is up at the collection of. Uh, this is from the Albright Knox uh, Gallery in Buffalo. This is where this painting is now. And this is Sunnyside Switch. It's from the Hunter Museum. It's now in the Hunter Museum of American Art. 80 by 80? Yeah, this one is um, 80 by 80. Yeah. I remember that's a good picture. This is the it one that this it is the one that Henry Henry sold on Henry un, sold un, the table. unknown right. to you. Right. All right. Um, and uh, I have a I have a little review of Larry's first show in 1963 from Jane Harrison. Who knows where she is? Um, but um, it's a one on, from the one-man show, she says... What are this? Is about eight feet, seven feet? Eighty by eighty. Yeah. Yeah. They come, the, the paintings come pretty close to being simply optical exercises, yet are saved by the subtle evasiveness of overall patterning of dots and ellipses. How does she know what an optical exercise is? I don't like? know. But here we go. Here we go. This is the positive stuff. And by the sh they're saved by the sheer radiance of the colors, which I think maybe that's right, but, you know, some people need to be focused. So she was, she got right on the, with that. This is in Forster, 1963. It's 80 by 80 inches. And it was first exhibited. I, That's what named I, what after I know. Frank Netty, Al Capone's enforcer. Ah. <laughs> yeah, it was shown along in a group show along with Frank Stella and others that were showing at the um, Green Gallery. Larry's been, that was a good show. been showing at the Green Gallery now. Um, we've got, this is, an, this is an entitled piece of, um, Pencil on graphite paper. This is sort of what I was talking about before, points and movements. Yeah. Sure. These early drawings are, are quite interesting because they allude to how he composed, how he composed. Well, they tell me where to put things initially. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Remember that release. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so he's got these, he starts in 1963, 1964, that's when this, this is dated. And um, the grid systems sort of be start becoming more elaborate with this second grid where you've got the diagonals kind of going through. You can, you can see the progression. It's very interesting. Larry moves from well, one painting. Things get overlaid. Right. It seems well, to have always been with <clears throat> This is something that with, with Larry's work, he, gets, he never gets comfortable with staying with an idea. Uh, I, think it, I think it was Lucas Samaras that said, you had said something to him at the gallery and said, Something like well, I said, I didn't know what I was going to do next, and he said, what to yes. Paint. And he said, oh, Larry, your poons. You You'll know. do dots. And something. Jesus, you know. You know, but Larry always, always never gets, finds himself very comfortable. He always moves to the next thing. So you've got this other grid patterns coming in. This is, is this? this is Northeast Grave. Right, right. That's it's 90 by 80. Hollis Frampton gave it that title. It's a bunch of places out in Boston Harbor, if you look at a map. Uh -huh. Yeah, Northeast Grave and uh -huh. yeah, Hollis Frampton name. What was the name here in this? Northeast Grave. Northeast Grave. Yeah. All right. So now we're moving into like 1966, 1967-ish. Um, you've got this introduction of additional colors. Um, you, he's also starting to play. I think you're also starting to play with like an after image, what the color would look like. They were after images, images from the very beginning, right. which was just like, as I said, a door price. Right, you know? different tonalities yeah. of the color. Yeah. You know? yeah. This is called Sicilian Chants, and it's at it's the Hirshhorn Museum. It's a yellow Museum. picture. I hope is it? that isn't a recent. It's a, it's a yellow ground <laughs> with blue dots and black dots. Wow. So well, this is from this, is this is from the Metropolitan the Museum. So, mode is in its well, uh, that, this is where I got this slide. The slide sometimes so. this happens to Sure, slide. sure. So, oh, I'm glad you're here to correct that. Um, this is called um, Ria 
What's it called? What's this one called? I don't know. Riva. Um, oh, Via Regia. Via Regia. Another. Friend. This was right. first exhibited in 1965 at the Whitney Annual, and it's in the collection of the Hirshhorn Museum. Oh, well, they have that. Huh. Yeah. Hmm. This is an un this is an untitled. It's a very small piece. Well, that was a dot picture that that got canceled. <laughs> it stayed over the years. <laughs> and this one is this is this true? This is the only painting of the dots that you have in your collection that well, you hold you know, on to. Well, you know, it was the old thing. I'll make a small picture so we can sell. Because we can I sell it. I tried and I hated it, and I painted half of it out and just threw it away. But it stayed with me all these years. Yeah. So I still have it. And I like so it. this is 16 by 16 inches. And this is called Jessica's Hartford. Yeah, that's about 12 feet high. Yeah. This is tw 128 inches, so it's yeah. a little... The vertical picture. God, it looks tiny. Yeah. It's, that's actually, it's actually 12 feet high. Okay. See, that's the funny thing about slides. You know, if you don't get scale, you know, mm -hmm. you, um, don't, you don't have any idea really what you're looking at. This, this, this is fantastic. This is Mary Queen of Scots. It's in the collection of... Right now, it's in the collection of James Rosenquist. And I actually helped make this painting be available for the Nassau County Museum for their exhibition in the 60s. I don't know if anyone got to go out and see that. But this painting took up the entire room. It went from the floor to the ceiling. And they have, you know, 13 feet ceilings. It was just amazing. And um, you can see the, the patterning and, and sort of this, this play with color that your eyes jumps to. It, 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 one of the first ones that got started to get a new kind of complexity with sure. a lot of different it's, colors. Yeah, the, it's a little bit, and, and I think it's, a, it's, yeah. it's more loosely painted. So you're, right? Yeah, it, yeah. Yeah. You mean it's sloppier. Yeah, it's a little sloppy. Yeah. 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 In 1965, uh, Larry showed at the Responsive Eye Exhibition at MoMA, which... This yeah. is a Whitney picture. And this is in the collection of the Whitney. This is 10 feet by, uh, by 10 inches by 7 feet and 6 inches. And of course they wouldn't show it. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually... I have their exhibition oh, history, know, and that, they showed it. Others. They showed it constantly. I mean, not constantly, but basically every Over other year for about ten years, and then yeah. it it's disappeared. It's probably mm -hmm. in some exec's office. <laughs> this is Wildcat Wildcat Arrival, 1966. Difficult, like, difficult. Yeah. yeah, a green. Green's yeah, always difficult. difficult. Yeah. Um, so in your in these in these dot paintings, I mean, I've I've done some some reading about um, some things. Uh, you had an, you did an interview with someone. It's in the collection of the uh, Smithsonian, and you had talked about the fact that you want these paintings to explode where the edges define but don't confine the paintings. Mm. Yeah. Sounds good. Does it sound good? <laughs> All right. I'm updating. I'm updating the archives as we go here. And uh, Sidney Timon said Tillum, uh, Tillum. Tillum um, reviewed uh, his one of his exhibitions in 1965. He says the effect of Poon's pictures, um, electric points of color on monochrome films, is what Mondrian hoped to achieve in his boogie woogie sense of dynamic equilibrium. Poon's is a logic successor, not only demonstrating how color can produce a spatial volume, but can animate it through optical opticality to achieve movement, which is nice. And then Max Kasloff said that Poon seems one of the most promising harbingers of the future. And this is sort of the end of, you know, when Luke, basically you're getting sick of dots, are you? I'm not getting sick of them, you know, but like... Uh, They're sort of running their course, right? You know, there's, there's more to be done. I mean, the, sure. Beethoven's first piano sonata sound like his last? You know, I mean, <laughs> was there even any resemblance? You know, I mean, I'm not saying I'm Beethoven analogy. or like Beethoven, but there are examples of being an artist that come naturally. One of them is, of course, you don't end the way you start. How could you? You know, being an artist, you get better or you, you change, you get different. You know, it comes natural. The idea is not success and money because then you don't change anymore. Then, once you're successful, that's it. You don't change. Mm -hmm. Why do people think that that is necessarily the, the hallmark of being an artist today? I mean, this so-called, well, we like it. Boom. That's all you need to hear. Okay, so it's not that I'm at war with anything, but I get bored. 
you know, and I, you know, if, you, if you're not going to get any better, then it's a good idea to go do something else. As I said, if you're not doing what you can do best, that's not a good thing. So, uh, in order to keep charged up, you change. And this is it, it's corny to say you take on new challenges, because if you knew what the challenge was, you'd already be there. You know. So you step off into things you're not quite sure of. So this is 1967. And I started freehanding. Started you know, no more them. grid patterns, no more progressions. It was just like, paint them free. <coughs> and I found out I could get away with it. Now, when I first started painting those, those first dots, I needed those grids because I, I didn't believe it. I didn't even realize that I could lay something out without a plan. I wasn't being clever. I was just simply trying to get away with being a painter, the way I'm doing now and the way I'm doing there. I mean, that was the first time that I, could, I ever freehanded a painting, you know, was this series of paintings. Meaning, just start in anywhere and, and finish it. This is in a collection of the Whitney. Also, there was some rolled ones. Some of them are, are painted with a brush, and then some of them were painted on a, a round tube and rolled on. You know, mm. so you get, you know, some variations. Who owns it? Uh, it's in the Whitney, <coughs> Whitney Museum. Oh, I thought it was in Europe. Yeah, another one is. This is 1968. This is nine. It's a vertical, nine feet by seventeen. Yeah, it's a feet. vertical. Goes the is other it? Way, but that's okay. Yeah, it's a vertical. Do you yeah, want, can you go back? We've got to see. This, this. Lots of times people got these pictures, and because back? they couldn't hang them up in the house, the ceilings sure. weren't high enough. They'd hang them sideways. Oh, there you go. Yeah. It's, that's upside down. But, <laughs> no, actually, when it's there right, when it's right side Thank up, you. it looks like Thank a you. flower. You know, sure. The stuff oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> Carter Burton used to own this picture. Yeah. And um, I think, or maybe it's another one I'm thinking. In of. an in an article in, in in an article in Art Forum in the summer of 1968, um, uh, Kermit uh, Krampa said that. Um, like Poon's great work, like Pollock's great works of 1949 to 1950, this is sort of the first references that people start making because Larry's using the entire canvas. He's using the entire field, feeling, filling it, accenting it, touching it, you know, uh, animating it. So he says that Poon's have, uh, uh, like Pollock's great works from 1949 to 1950, Poon's have accepted <clears throat> uh, responsibility for their all over surface, stressing the continuity rather than their focus. Uh, Pollock's units were primarily linear, and Poon's are pr primarily coloristic. Uh, Pollock began seeking out more of a, uh, of a definitive configuration of a line, while um, Larry's work um, in his new paintings, which are the, the ones we just saw, had begun to re-examine the properties of the color image, the properties. Which is sort yeah, of a nice, 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 well, it's a nice comparison because you responded to, to Pollock's work in a way that I don't. <laughs> you don't like Jackson Pollock's work. Yeah. Well, it is Night Journey. Night Journey. This is nine, nine feet by ten I feet. I think the red's on the right. It is. Oh, you mean the red's on the yeah, left? Yeah, on the left. Yeah. That's okay. That's a big picture. Yeah. This is Dodge Palace, 19... Doge's, Doge's Palace. Palace, 1969. That's Leslie Feely. Yeah. See, here you can get a scale of a picture. Yeah. That's got a lot of those rolled-on ellipses. The, the color was like... Yeah. With a broom, a big broom up there. Yeah, that's a nice picture. This is a nice piece. This is um, 44 by 16. Rhode Island School of Design. I think. Rhode yeah. Island. That's a good picture. It was never shown in New York. They just came and got it one day. It's like a prisma. You have the, the yeah, prisma, the yeah. colors coming in of the prisma. And uh, Larry's work was included in Henry Geltzeller's big ex the big Henry. exhibition. Oh, uh, Larry's painting, Larry's work was, uh, partici he participated in the New York painting and sculpture exhibition 1940-1970 with Henry Geltzahler. How many paintings did you show in that show? I don't remember. 
But he, he showed, showed a number new, of them. He showed all the new pictures, you know, right, which right. was really great. Of what was it like working with him? Henry? Yeah. Henry was a, a, was a supporter for a long time, yeah. from the early yeah. dots. And even in, in 1994, when he had republished some of his writing, he included an interview that Larry, he did with Larry, which is very nice in his book. And then there was the Jules Olitsky show in mm -hmm. late, early 70s at the Met. The sculpture show. Right. Yeah. How did that affect you? How did that affect your work? I just felt invited, revitalized by the sculptures that I saw. Yeah, yeah. So the years to follow are what I, I'd like to... I characterize it as like a bombastic pursuit of total pain, uh, painterliness. I mean, it's just an attack of the canvas and really getting your... I mean, Larry's sort of taking the stage to get to the point where he's just throwing himself into it what as if he was... This is uh, the 1969 Streb's Rich. Is that right? Mm -hmm. It's a smallish picture. It's a 48, 48 by 23 inches. Right. <coughs> Lousy Fear of 1970. It's 103 inches by 7 feet. Mm -hmm. yeah, nice. yeah. And then, of course, the Railroad Horse, 1971. Um, it's in the collection of uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And That's a long picture. It was recently displayed at the Reflections of Monet, which is sort of a nice, fun comparison to make if you go from that to this. Can we go back again? Yeah. I mean, it's an enormous painting. It's 90... Well, the color's really a lot brighter and sharper than that. Right, and then you get a lot of distance This from is this. actually from the Rubin Gallery. This slide's from the Rubin Gallery, hmm. where it was first shown. Uh, Ken Moffat, who was at the time that the, he had written, he was writing for the Boston Museum Bullets, and he was also the, I guess he was a curator at Boston as well, right? Um, he, he said that Railroad Horse evokes something of a feeling of a grand and glorious event in nature, which is very, very nice. And Frank Stella, in this unpublished essay that he's written called, I forgot to give you the title. It's well, it's yet to be published, so I'm sort of leaving it there. It's called, he titled it Mr. Natural. Larry Poons, uh, Nassie on Larry Poons. He says that this is an elegant fusion of abstract expressionism and, and color field painting. It is a forward-looking attempt but the, uh, uh, to put the best of the 50s and 60s painting into play. He has everything going for it in the size, the scope, purpose, originality, and the ability to carry out a compelling conviction about the importance of art making. Which is, so we go back to Monet, which is nice. This is called C. Robin. I think it's backwards. No, it's backwards. Is it? Yeah. And this is 93 inches by 106 inches. These are the first pictures that were done by throwing paint on an upright canvas. Did you start? Um, did you start with little buckets, or did you just big go with buckets. the big ones? In fact, and this railroad is horse was the first picture that was painted that way. This is called yeah. hummingbird. Yeah. 71. <clears throat> These are big pictures. Yeah. Mm. This is called First Wild. It's 90. Now this goes back. This is before the throw pictures. This was painted on the floor. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you've got. Yeah. What? Yeah, this is before Railroad Horse. That's, that's an egg? That's an egg. Okay. Yeah. And there's a big one there. See? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a big picture. Yeah. That's, that's, that's nice. nice. Why? That's so who coined the term elephant skin? Michael Fried, I think. Yeah. So he was the first. He, he called them elephant skin pictures. And the, he also titled, he sort of dissected Larry's work and cut it in half. He had the elephant skin on one side and the drip paintings on another side. Why is and it out of focus? Is it out, it, is it out of focus? It is. <laughs> That's a little better. He, he, but he, he makes an interesting comment. I, I like a lot of what Michael Fried says um, when he says things. Um, the throws of paint have an ungestural directness of, a, an, of an attack, which, is, which, which seems very, very nice. And he also comments on the gradi gradation value of color, how Larry actually was working with the color and how it mixes sort of naturally. You know, for better or worse, you're not looking at a painting here. You're looking at mm -hmm. a slide. And you, you know, don't think that you're looking at a painting because you're not. And these have a lot of tactility to them. Well, 
I mean, it's yeah. just a different experience. It's maybe like, you want me to whistle Mozart, and you think you understand the opera? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, no comparison meant, but I mean, slides are close to what, to music, what whistling is. Gives you, it might give you an idea. And this is 1972. This is 115 by 90, 92 inches. This is another untitled. It's 98 by 174. Dark picture. It, uh, it, it's very reminiscent of like a Morris Lewis kind of an effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what was your interest in color? Some are monotonal, some are what? chromatic. What was your interest in color? In what? The, the question was, what, is, what was your interest in color? Um, well, painting is nothing but color. Hmm. You can't talk about painting and not talk about color. Color is what defines painting. There is no painting that isn't color. Color and painting are synonymous. What about the color palette? There's a change, there's a shift in color palettes. Well, anybody can see that. <laughs> <laughs> So there's no separation. Okay, Bill. There's there's no separation. There's no separation between color and form. You know, somebody came up to Brahms. This is a famous story. After some premiere at the party afterwards, and said, "You know, I think I heard a little bit of this in there, and a little bit of Haydn, and maybe a little bit of Buxtehude. You know, and I think, you know, like I might have heard an inkling of a Haydn, uh, of a Handel fugue somewhere. You know, maybe, were you influenced by that?" And Brahms looked at this guy and said, any ass can hear that. <laughs> so what's the message there? The message is, what about the art? So what if it's a picture that shows a bunch of nuns? That doesn't tell you about the art. So what if it's a picture of a square? That doesn't tell you about the art. Any fool can see that. Any fool can see it's a red painting. Any fool can see it's three raccoons in a house. That doesn't tell you anything about the art. <laughs> and so much of what goes on today passes for art by this stupid description of stuff. It doesn't tell you anything. Any jerk can see it looks like a square. <laughs> so my, one of my favorite, this is probably my most favorite quote of anyone who's talked about Larry's work, and it's, by Donald Cuspud, it was in 1972 in art form, he said, I'm frankly flabbergasted by these paintings. One thinks of Poons as a fire eater swallowing what would kill another painter, but coming away unharmed. He has an enormous appetite for surface, which he covers with condiments and, um, and consumes without pausing for breath. Poons is like a gluttonous python that seems to have swallowed a big whole surface and we get to watch him digest it. His friends got on his case so oh, I'm sure. That, that he didn't ever touch me again. That's right. He hasn't yeah. said a word about yeah. you since. So That's right. we're moving on to I mean, how could a guy write such stuff and not be at your next show taking a look? Yeah. You know? But he wrote that and I don't know, something happened, right? They, Never again. I think they got to him. <laughs> right? I don't know. Yes. Um, at this time, Larry moves uh, to Nolder Company. Um, I think that you were represented by... Larry Rubin. Rubin until yeah. then, right? Yeah, but Larry Rubin was also Nolder. Right. Yeah. Okay. This is 72nd Street Dead, 1973. It's 73 by 72 100 inches. 72nd Street, what? 72nd... Oh, this isn't it. No, that's all right. That's all right. We're not there yet. I'm sorry, I skipped the slide. No, I, wasn't I put this one in because I can, you can kind of feel digestion. That's a very tall painting. Yeah. This is it. This is 92nd Street Dead. It's uh, 73 by 100 inches. What year? This is another one. 73. This is an untitled 1974. It's 55 inches by, 70, by 29 inches. A little bit. There's a small one for you. Did that one sell? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I guess it's sold. This is called Getting Straight. It's in the collection of Albright Knox Museum. Yeah, or, I'm sorry, gallery. And what's the size of that? That's 90 inches. This is 108 by 68. Mm -hmm. This is an untitled, again, 86 by 42. And 
and this is, this is called Goodbye Vinny. It's in a private collection in Michigan. And at this time, you're working, you're throwing the buckets. This is bucketing. Still doing it, yeah. All right. And the bucket is merely an extension of your hand, of your brush. Right? Anger. Anger. Yeah, maybe. You must have had really big muscles to lift <laughs> a whole gallon bucket of gel and toss it. And toss it. Determination. And I think we should take, I think everyone knows how Larry works. He puts Thank the, you. he put the, um, Since I started throwing paint, right. the canvas goes around the walls. He put it around the walls and they were, you know, tacked up there and then Larry would mix and sort of mix, right? You wouldn't really like make sure it was a full color, right? Yeah, anything. No. You could do anything. Yeah, right. Yeah. So he's playing with this and then he goes back into it and, and tapes off the paintings after he's, after he's through, after you've sort of decided that the canvas can't handle anymore, right? No, when it's finished. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you start, this is, um, this is it, this one's here. It's night. Reminds me of like melted. There's a Nolan behind it. Yeah, I think this is a Ken Nolan here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is another. I think this is when st stuff starts falling into your paint. Isn't this when you started putting? Well, is some, no. Let's things into it. No, just paint the strings. Stuff no. Like that. Yeah. This is 1977. This is 114 Actually, inches. Actually, something would get dry, and then maybe I'd go back into it with some. But the heavy the paint, paint starts. Next, you can see that like way. how the paint starts building up. The surface has these little points of texture that start mounting. Car carrot shit? Carrot shit. Okay. What? Carrot sh <laughs> We want to know about carrot shit. Okay. Carrot. 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 I used to have a bird. Okay. <laughs> you used to have a bird. All right. This is 86 inches by 46 inches. And this is 1978. And uh, about that time, you switched to the Andre Emmerich, right? Yeah. Another nice piece. There we go. This is this yes. is 1979, and this is 77 inches by 28 inches. I think some of that stuff was purposely put on beforehand. Yeah. Some of it was purposely put on, yeah. placed on. Beforehand, yeah. And this is a nice, nice quote from Terry um, Fenton, who was at the time uh, the director and curator of contemporary art in Alberta, Canada. In Canada. Um, he says that Poon's paintings are among the supreme achievements of the past decade. His best pictures stand comparison with the masterworks of Pollock and Lewis. I'm exasperated by my inability to account, to, uh, account adequately for their, their quality. The world is filled with paint fingers and process artists whose work amounts to little, whose end product doesn't live up to what to its means, and whose means is not the kind of feeble is, is a kind of feeble theater. <coughs> Poons never succumbs to theater, he never loses sight of the end. No matter how he applies his paint, he paints it always with his eyes. Which is nice. That reminds me of somebody saying to Allen Ginsberg. Uh, something like, well, you know, all your friends have sold out. You stick with it, you know, you do this, you know, serious stuff. You know, how come, Alan? You haven't sold out. And Alan said, nobody's made an offer. <laughs> <laughs> so that is. Yeah. Here we go. This is getting really messy. Oh, that's, I like that's that. nice. It's like nice. That. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's nice. And um, Valentin um, Taransky, I don't know where some of these art writers are. Well, you are. see, there's got to be more, you know, if yeah. you think painting is dead, you know, painting isn't dead, but damn it, you know, there's more to do. You've got to do it, you know. I yeah. mean, uh, if things, quote, unquote, things can't be put in pictures anymore, then of course painting's dead. So, like, the re, for me, the, the introduction of all kinds of stuff is beginning, you know. Uh, 
not to save pain, but to keep on pain. <coughs> Me, to keep yeah. on pain. Yeah. The most impressive thing about Poon's development is how he's always moved on from his best picture. He's gone from good to better and better to great. It's 1980, 1983. It's very, very nice. Ah, focus. Yeah, yeah. You see, now this surface, I started using that stuff that they won't allow you to put in landfills because it never disintegrates, you know? The mm -hmm. stuff you make in pillows and stuff. Like your Polyfill. Yeah, polyfill. You know, I mean, it's like cotton, right? So I build up the surface with that and start, you know, getting all these crazy shapes and stuff and then, you know, still throwing the paint. You come up with some, like... This is know. 92 inches by 36 inches. Oh, that's beautiful. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Look at the, I mean, the colors, uh, on this slide you can see the color, you can see what he's, what he's up to. I think this one's, um, You see, there's hope. If you saw, you know, if people still laugh when you say this is beautiful, there's hope for it. Is this, yeah, is this, is this Lou Lou Lou? Yeah. This is Lou Lou Lou. Yeah. This is 1988. It's 92 inches by 203 inches, so it's roughly 7 feet, 8 inches, and I think around 16, yeah, 11, 16 yeah. feet, 11 inches. Yeah. Of course, this is Andre Emmerich. You can tell by the lights across the top. It's very <laughs> nice. This is an untitled 1989. Well, there's big shapes in this one. Yeah, this is yeah. quite thick. Yeah. I like this basketball. It's a Nerf ball. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Uh, then you move to Salander O'Reilly with 1990, and this is called French. That's, it's sort of on its side, but that's okay. Oh, is it? Yeah, it, the color's Should've... not like that at all. Well, you didn't want to check any of the orientation of these earlier, so. But you get the idea. I mean, you've got big plates of texture going on in there. Which is... There's all kinds of stuff. Oh, you have to go. You'll have to go back and then forward again because I think this slide actually gets stuck. If not, we'll just have to skip it. Go there's again. There it is. You need some focus. There we go. Oh, there's that picture. It's very yeah, this brown. Is... It's actually like bright reds and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I mean, these slides are like just disintegrating in terms of color. This is called baby. What is this one called? Baby, baby you don't, you don't know. know. My mind today. It's a. Uh, <laughs> A Jimmy Martin song. And this is 1990. And this is Baby, a fun... Maybe you don't know my mind today. This is a fun comparison. So you go from like this to, to that. I mean, this is... Uh, it, it's... It, the you, slide machine's out of focus. On you, the want the, you want the texture there to live there. I just see such, so much vitality coming out of the, the previous painting. Can we go back? I mean, this is like human. That's great. All right, so we're going to move. Oh, this is, Michael Kimmelman reviewed your first show there, and he said that, it, as it just, uh, he says, just as it wasn't easy for Jackson Pollock, it clearly isn't easy for Mr. Poons, working in nearly unfettered way that he does to su sustain coherence across wide and complex surfaces. Um, but there's an ambition and also a religious belief in modernist ideals that commands respect. He's another it's guy nice. that wrote something kind of half nice and then he never sure. touched it again. <laughs> and of course he states the obvious. These are in many ways the most convincing cross between Jackson Pollock and Morris Lewis. Which is nice. So there's flat. This is called, this is called Beethoven. This is 84 inches by 101 inches. Yeah. So it's 7 feet. The seven feet square. Yeah. This is 1993. This is an untitled piece. Kind of reminds me of a du buffet. You can see, yeah. Yeah, like all these shapes and stuff start to come out. Sure. And I'm painting over. Well, I, what I like to see is this is you start to see that drawing. Yeah. You really start to see like a line sort of weaving in and out. Well, I was drawing on the canvas before I put the stuff on. And before I put yes. the paint on. Yeah. There we go. That was in focus there. Yeah. So this is an exhibition shot from Salander. One of the oh, one of the only good slides I got from them. <laughs> and this painting is here. Yeah. 
Are, are the lines textured or drawn for both? You wanna... They're drawn first and then laid over with the... Uh... want to get the lights. All right. This is 1994. It's 91 inches by 108 inches. 181 inches, I'm sorry. This is a really, this is a sour, sour slide as well, but at least you get the idea. It's called Imperial Abstract. It's 1994. It's 85 inches by 191 inches. This is 1995, and um, this is one of my favorites. It's called All the Time. You can see the, the drawing through the, with the texture. It looks like a piano. Yeah, it does. So, um, Roberta Smith reviewed a exhibition, uh, the the last exhibition, I guess. No, in 96, she reviewed the show at Sound O'Reilly. She says that these, these new canvases unfurl before the eyes like semi-abstract abstract landscapes or opulent interiors. But their visual richness is at every point grounded in the painting's physical infrastructure, which is very nice. <laughs> these, are, these are drawings on colored, this is ink on colored paper. This is 1996. Yeah, drawings of rocks out west. Mm -hmm. Look at some of the paintings. Yeah. They look nice. <laughs> Yeah, they do. The drawings come across on slides. I really you like know, them. because they're not paintings. That's why. Mm -hmm. Drawings are not paintings. Mine. Slides work for, for drawings. So David Ed Ebony was actually the only one who haven't even commented on the fact that Larry was exhibiting drawings because as far as I know you had Well, it came as the biggest surprise to me as like anyone else would really? have been surprised. Yeah, yeah. But he says that unlike the earlier grid-based drawings, these small works on colored paper are free-flowing sketches and um, he went on to say how it was wonderful to be able to see how he was building our how he was thinking, how this, how his mind was thinking. And uh, this is an editorial. If you haven't seen the Jackson Pollock drawings up at, um, at uh, Jan, I think it's Washburn, they're very nice as well. Not, but they're nice because you can see these colored drawings. And, These are the new, this is, this is fairly recent. This is Nebraska. Yeah, can we go back and put it back? Yeah, that's weird. This is called Nebraska. It's 91 inches by 112 inches. This is backwards. This is backwards. I'm the, I, I have to admit, I'm the worst person with slides. Creative. There we go. This is Whirly Roy Tom. Some, this, is, this painting I, I, ex, I exhibited last summer in my exhibition five. And it was included with the work of um, Judith Dolnick, Bruce Dorfman, Robert Natkin, and Joel Perlman. 
It's very nice. You see here, I stopped, I stopped throwing the paint and just started painting the shapes in. Mm -hmm. So the brush is back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is, this is backwards, too. That's it? backwards. This one's backwards. Are you sure? The writing's on yes. the side of that one. Yeah, that's there we go. Somebody wrote it. Yeah. There you go. This is called Pillow 1997. It's 91 by 84 inches. Oh, this is backwards. Where everything's backwards. <laughs> yeah. That's backwards. They're all backwards. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> Were these in the last show at Solander? Uh, no, this hasn't, Pillow hasn't been exhibited. These last ones, no one has seen. Well, now, see, here you can see a drawing, okay? Now the drawing gets turned into a painting. I think that's the next slide. Right. This is, this is a study for Will Your Soul Pass Through the Southland. Yeah. And that's the... This is a large one. painting. Yeah, this painting, this measures 90, uh, 74 inches by 162 inches. It's a beautiful song by the old country gentleman called Will My Soul Pass Through the Southland, about a Confederate soldier who's dying, and those are his last words. Oh. Seemed like a nice title. So you can see the mountains and stuff. <clears throat> this is... Um, this is Andre Masson, Battle of the Fishes, 1927. Oh. It's in the collection of MoMA. Let's go back. You know, we got something in common. Well, I kind of like this yeah, comparison. I, I thought oh, it was really? sort of fun. Really? Yeah. I thought it was a different There's something in common there. Yeah. I mean, on, sure. Masson couldn't, couldn't mix paint, but, you know, he yeah, had the surrealist idea. Drawing good. Yeah. Drawing good. This is nice. Yeah. This one's... Um, well, that's backwards. <laughs> this is backwards. We got problems. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yeah, that's messy. <laughs> yeah. This is 76 inches by 88 inches. And this is going to be shown at um, Larry's show in March at um, Theo Waddington in Boca Raton. It's about, what, eight, six feet, seven feet, huh? Seven feet. Yeah. And that shape up there looks like Nessie, you know, the Loch Ness thing. <laughs> <laughs> I got that title for it. That's upside down, backwards. <laughs> so it's, it's backwards and it's upside down. Upside down? Oh my. I just deliver the slides, I don't load them. No, it's slides are such a problem. Yeah, this is a kind of small picture. Yeah, this one is. Um, uh, this is 77 inches by 26 inches. And this is a fun comparison. We go from this to that. This is a Kandinsky, of course. This is about the same size, 64 inches by 31 inches. Uh -huh. Do you want to go back? Yeah. I want to go back. Go back one more. Yeah. What's the title of that one, please? Uh, we don't have a title. Little one. Oh, it's little one. Little one. Little one. As in, he does lots of large paintings, and then he'll paint a small one, so that one will sell in the show. Yeah. It's called the little one. <laughs> All right. Uh, this one's correct. That's almost correct. Yeah. That's kind of big, big new painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This one is uh, 78 inches by 116 inches. And then the last slide is the Compression Sisters, which is my favorite. Compression? The Compression Sisters. <laughs> see the breast? <laughs> you can still see that outline here. of his. He's left a lot of the drawing in with the marker. <coughs> How could, it's focused here, but it's not there. It's I weird. know, all of them. All right, so that's the end of the slides. Yeah. We can talk about it. So I have just I have one question, and that is, it's sort of it's a, it's a big one, but so what's next? In what way? Well, I'm sure you've already started another role. I'm working on one. Yeah. 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 God bless. Yeah. What? Quite a body of work. I said, God bless you. 
Well, I mean, that, that's just a, like, that's not even the tip of the iceberg of 40 years. Well, I, I went through thousands and thousands of slides, and I, I like to keep it, I like to try to keep it fast moving and not a lot of slides, but, you know, 80s was really hard. It was really hard to give up a lot of the paintings because you can see, you can see him working in every single one. It's, imagine giving him a retrospective. Well, that's another question that I have, you know. You've got the, the museum system now that doesn't seem to be paying too much attention to. Why not? <laughs> you want to know? You want to know my opinion? Yeah. That's exactly it. It's economics, and I think that it, you can't. You can have a, a, a Larry Poon's retrospective. I don't and agree. I, I think it's because people are afraid to speak out. Why don't you write yeah. a letter? Well, of all the letters that I can write, you know, it doesn't. We can't hear you if you talk from the audience, lest we repeat what you said. Oh. Uh, uh, somebody commented that, that we should write. But don't you know, like, but they popular, don't read. popular wisdom <laughs> says that this stuff is no good. But who's popular? But it's by the, your popular stuff. art popular culture, wisdom, that, that right? this stuff is no good. Don't fight back. <laughs> well, I think the best way to fight back is just to keep going forward. I really do. I think that's the best way. I mean, just keep painting because it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Movie painting Godard. well is the best revenge. That did is. Ever, did you ever see a movie by Godard called Alphaville? Yeah. Yeah. And it's about a secret agent called Lemmy Caution. <laughs> and so he goes into Alphaville right, to rescue the mad scientist's daughter, right? Falls in love with her. And they, they spend a night together and uh, there's a candle the end of the, of the room where they make love. And let me caution, who's played by Eddie Constantine, uh, all of a sudden takes out his 45 and shoots the candle out. The girl is just, just, what to do that for? She just freaks out. He, he just shot the candle out. He looks at his 45 and says, you see this? This is my only defense against fate. And so it always meant to me that Godard might have been, at least for me, saying, for an artist, your only defense against fate is your art. Mm -hmm. That's the Very only nice. way you can confront what happens to you, up or down or sideways, whatever it is. Your only defense against success, your only defense against being ignored, is you and your art. So, I mean, let me caution, he's just a Secret Service guy with a, with a gun, but that's his paintbrush, so to speak. That's how he stays alive. That's how he survives. But Darch is making that simple statement. So, Ronnie, your only defense against fate is to get better. <laughs> that's it. You know, I mean, look, I mean, most of the world is driven by commerce. And the art world is no damn different than that. And because it's driven by commerce, the people that run the art world would leave Van Gogh out in the middle of a fucking cornfield to die because they couldn't sell it. They weren't interested in it. That's the way things can get sometimes. Yeah, I agree, but the irony is they can sell anything. What? They can sell anything. The irony is you they can, can sell. You sell something yeah. for a zillion dollars if you can convince people it's better than. Or it's yeah. worth uh, Please, would you, if, if you can talk into the mic or give me a minute to repeat what you've said. If anybody wants to, has some questions, if you want to squiggle over this way, I'll get yeah. to you. It's kind of hard to reach back Where to you. Where is Larry's work in New York? Where, Where is Larry's work in New York right now? No, it's in, a, my, in my law. In your law. They're all <laughs> coming see, over, if you right? You see good paintings. It's Larry. It's in Larry's. It's Larry's loft. Unfortunately, Sound or O'Reilly doesn't have. If you went there and asked to pull out paintings, they've got an inventory there. But um, I the inventory. Really, you've taken them all out. That's why they wouldn't show me any when I asked anonymously. But there is there is a show well, coming up in. There are some fantastic model prints at Claudia Carr Gallery. Sure. I can't, sure. I can't, we didn't. Well, Claudia says that if you want to see some yeah. monoprints, which are very nice that Larry has done, um, they're at Claudia Carr. Larry's monoprints. I have quite yeah. a nice number of monoprints. And 
You might have found Claudia Carr. My gallery is at 478 West Broadway. Claudia Carr's gallery, 470 West Broadway. If you want to come see it, please call me first. You have to go and call them out. And I'll repeat yourself. One more time. Okay. I don't think we need it. Let's go. Let's. Okay. I have something to. If you want to see the monoplace. Well, I have, I, have, I, have something, I have something I'd like to continue uh, the discussion about the museums because there was a very interesting article that James Monte wrote in the December 1979, and he was talking about the fact, I mean, he's there, he's the curator of painting, he gets all these proposals that come in, and at the time, the Whitney, which is where he was working, reviewed them with the administrative board and the curative board, whether they were developed through the museum system or they came in anonymously. This is what was written. Anyway, and he says that when this letter was written that um, in, the, in when the, he says, a genteel tone prevailed most of these meetings mm -hmm. until this letter came concerning Larry Poon's exhibition. This is 1979, so um, he says, he says that uh, there was a genteel tone that prevailed most of the meetings. But then when this, um, the letter was read concerning the Poons exhibition, the, emo the emotional temper temperature rose alarmingly. As the letter was read, people began at once to talk over each other. Voices normally silent rose higher with each passing moment. A person from the film or educational department, he doesn't remember, announced with an overwrite authority that the artist had painting nothing since the early 1960s. And then another person said further down the table, and barely audible over the, all the confusion, said that new abstract painting is in a, starry, a sorry state. And then the, the final person said... I agree with him. Yeah, that's true. The final person said, um, very sternly, apparently, who knows what the artist might do? The exhibition propo propo uh, proposal was supposed to be in, uh, within the next year, and they were frightened that... Who knows what Larry might do? Those, and, of course, those who... What do follow you mean, the museums. I, do? I, I don't know what that meant, but I think that they couldn't count on you doing something that's very safe, that it would be pressing, that it would challenge us artistically, it would challenge us with, uh, with your colors, with the, the, the color mixing, the way you're dealing with texture, and, you know, anyway. So well, that's, show, that's, very, that's I, I an interesting show, I thing. I that, that would take the best out of 40 years and, you know, make, make a show of 50 or 60 paintings could really look like something. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Stella, in this, in this essay, says that Larry Poons has produced the most ambitious art for the last 40 years, and for the last 30 years he has produced successful and ambitious art that has gone largely unrecognized in the face of the more popular art, which I think is quite... Um, it's quite profound. Well, I mean, it's quite, it is, but he lists like performance art, video art, neo, neo geo, neo expressionism. These things are sort of uh, coming along the line there. But um, it's sort of interesting because I think that if the art world would close their eyes and forget Larry Poon's The Dot Maker and sort of go see a new, act, new show and open their eyes and well, see know, these things forgot, for the first time. They forgot the kid that painted dots when they started to associate the dot pictures with uh, Victor Vassarelli or yes, Richard yeah. Riley, they had nothing to do with those, with those okay. kinds of pictures, you know. When they, when, they, when they kind of brought it into a category of so-called op, sure, op, op, op where, you know, if anything, I was striving to be as ambitious as Newman, you know, uh, in those paintings. And, uh, I mean, they, they look like they attempt to. You know, they, they don't have anything to do with being op, op. Everything's optical, for Christ's sakes. What the hell <laughs> isn't optical? But it's easier for the curatorial staff to say, look, this is, this oh, is visual, the, 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 this, the is, this looks nice, war. and let's put this one next the to Greenberg this one. The Greenberg Wars polarized everything, sure. you know? I mean, if you want it to did. call it such. It did, I mean, it did. It got polar, polarized so much that... It's a double standard. Yeah. I mean, uh, what do you mean by that? I want to. Can you give me double? Let's, let's pass Ronnie the mic. If anyone hasn't read Ronnie's recent. Uh, All right. Well, what I mean by double standard especially applies to Larry because in the 60s, Larry painted beautiful paintings. And uh, he was well known for. Even when he, he, when he dropped the dots, his paintings were still very beautiful. However, in, the, in, in terms of, of what's today de rigueur, you have to be shocking. You, ha you have to do things that are ugly. You have to do things that 
stand people's hair on end sure. in order for the museums to get excited about giving well, they want cycle, commerce aside. Well, they want cycle drama. They want me to, they want whatever to, they to want. talk about... Uh, whatever they want. Larry's well, work see, has grown. Oh, Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie. They most want of him... All, don't you realize, Ronnie, most of all, they do not want to be proven wrong. <laughs> from you, that's, they, they, that's they the want from you it. what they demand that's other people don't it. do. And, and, and it's, it's not changed. right. It's a double standard. Beethoven used to complain at the end of his life that nobody recognized him anymore. They didn't know who the hell he was <laughs> anymore. You know, I mean, it isn't as terrible as you think. It's plenty bad. I think it is. I think it's you know? quite, it's worse. What? I think from what Jason said at this meeting, well, Larry Poons hasn't done anything. You read that letter. Well, that was like 1979. But what, so the reason they're now, saying that course, is because yes. they're demanding he do what they want him to do. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Larry has never done that, they demand other people paint ugly paintings, to be simple, quite simple. Sure. If you look at what Larry, if you look at the moves Larry made, and then you look at Schnabel, say, They'll accept it from Julian Schnabel. Well, well I'm not putting it down. Well, the only thing that I, I hate but they to do, want I, from what I really hate to do is, <clears throat> and I don't want to sound too uh, authoritative, but I don't like to bring other artists' work in when we talk about Larry because he's totally different. I, I agree no with you. you I'm, I'm just saying Julian it's a Schnabel double standard. Because, that oh, certainly, I understand that. I mean, they want something that's new and they want something that's cutting edge. They want to find out. They want the, they really, what they really want is the story behind it because they like the educational and cultural side to it. And unfortunately, Larry is pure painting. And that's what Stella talks about. It's Larry, if Larry could walk the streets and it rained, you'd find color coming down the pavement, washing into the gutter. That's exactly what, the way that I see Larry, you know. Um, Larry, do you have cause for optimism? What? Do you have any cause for optimism? In, in regards to what? Well, what, the way Global you think the art world is going. What? What? Somebody said before, I, I would love to know what Larry Poons thinks of the art world. Well, I think we're getting a guess that, you know, we can kind of guess a little bit. But um, do you think there's cause for optimism? Do you think there's well, well, artists how would coming you define up? Optimism? Well, you some mean? artists coming up that you think have merit, and, and the what? Uh, some artists coming up that you think have merit, or uh, do you think painting's dead? No. <laughs> you know. You know. Here's the thing about painting or art or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you understand that? I mean, you know, uh, I mean, you know, to say something is dead is nuts. Of course it isn't dead. How could it be? Because people can't do it? Well, people never could do it. Three people every 100 years make a difference. You know, when you, when you look at history, how many, how many great artists are there every 100 years? How many great poets are there every hundred years? You know? I mean, think about it. I mean, that's why people who strive to be artists need to be stubborn. You know, because you got to do it. You know, and you got to get better. And there's always hope that maybe you will get better. Thank you for being so stubborn. No, <laughs> no, I'm not. Something in 1979, yeah, and you're still working, right? Well, that's something that I yeah. find very interesting because you know, yeah. in the, thought, because I'm seeing and I'm looking and I'm, I'm watching. Support from people. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. very important to keep going and have support from people. I've never been lacking of support from people. I mean, I've always, you know, Frank Stella very early on was supportive, and then there's a long silence, and all of a sudden, out of the yeah. shadows, Frank comes again and is supportive you know I mean I haven't been without support you know I mean Franz Schubert had support <laughs> <laughs> well he did well you always said that you'd be a, didn't you say that you would have been a you definitely would have been a composer if you would have had like the court there ready to play anything you said well as they say in the jazz circles if I'd had yeah. the chops had the chops yeah. Laurie yeah well uh, this is sort of maybe a little off the but who decides what's in, so to speak, or what's not in? Or who, Look, what's, it took 50 I hate to years use the word the trendy. I hate to use years. the word trendy, but who decides what's it trendy? It took 50 years 
for the general public to maybe start to recognize that maybe Jackson Pollock isn't flaky. Yeah. It's 50 years since but, those paintings but then, were made. 50 years! I have to add something I mean, with that. people like his contemporaries used to think he was a freak painting. They didn't want to take him seriously. So what else is new? Yeah. They really didn't. Yeah. And it's interesting because I went to see the Jackson Pollock show twice. I went once because in the middle I had a panic attack. I couldn't get beyond the people. I couldn't get to see the paintings. Mm -hmm. I also couldn't get past the fact that all I could hear in the back of my mind was cha-ching, 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 cha-ching with all the books, with all the posters, with everything. <laughs> I, couldn't get, I couldn't get to taste the art. You see, you and I would rather travel a couple of hundred miles to see a silent Jackson Pollock than to see young artists trying to study gesture uh, uh, young artists um, gathering around a painting, trying to find out what, was about, what it was about. What, what, was the, what happened to him psychologically, or what influenced him, and how can I it's be like affected the same way? It's like going to the, the Prado way. and standing in front of a, a wonderful Velasquez, say, sure. and in hearing the teacher speak to the children about Roman Catholicism in the painting. I mean, yeah. Valesca, as far as the painting is concerned, Velasquez could have been a Martian. You know, it's just a great painting, period. But, you know, it has no, you know, r r you know, the culture in which he lived and everything else doesn't make it a good painting or a bad painting. You know, the fact that he was an ambassador, so what? You know, so was Henry Kissinger, but he couldn't paint like Velasquez. I want to know, I want to know why in, the, why in the museum system you don't see a and remake. So like Pollock is here, he's shown for the wrong reasons, but so what? You see, they yeah. want to use Jackson Pollock well, they want as, to remake a a shed. as the end of abstraction so we can get to Rauschenberg and get to John's, what came after Pollock. Well, thank you very much. You see, that's why they don't want to show people like me, if we exist, because it ruins the argument that painting took a sudden turn with Rauschenberg after Pollock. It didn't. You know? You know, it's striving to get better than Pollock. That's what it's doing. You see, but they use Pollock as an end so that they can present Johns and Rauschenberg, thank you very much, as being the successors of, you know, of greatness, so to speak, quote, unquote. Right. It's the wrong reasons, but so what? The paintings, you can see them. So what? You know, most of the times things are done maybe for not the reasons you wish they were done, but at least they're done. And at least someone. I mean, doing why it. is it interesting that Pollock liked to drink and hit people? You know, there's so many people in the world that drink and hit people. Does that make them great <laughs> artists? So what's so special? Why even think that it has anything to do with his art? Because it doesn't. It makes absolutely no relationship to the man's gift and talent as an artist. What his stupid personal life was all about. It makes no difference if Beethoven was dead. Why should it make a difference? Or Milton was blind. Who gives a damn? It doesn't make him any better. It doesn't make it any worse. It's, it's a fact. That it's a fact of history. But as far as the art is concerned, who cares that Eliot was born in Kansas? As far as I'm concerned, he could have been born in St. Petersburg. It wouldn't make any difference. Read the poetry. That's what the difference is. Think about it. what really does make a difference. I mean, if a Martian with an acute visual sense suddenly hit the planet, do you think he couldn't recognize a great painting here or a great sculpture here? And he wouldn't know anything about our culture. He wouldn't have to. You don't have to know anything about culture to like music, do you? If you have an ear for it anyway. You don't have to say, oh, I don't know whether I like it or not. You've got to tell me which country it comes from first. Or you've got to tell me the sexual politics of the artist before I know whether it's interesting or not. Does that make sense? I mean, I mean it, it's, I'm not speaking politically. I'm only saying when you see and read and look at what's happening, does it make sense to relate this to this? That's all I'm saying. Does it make any difference that Einstein was a Jew and not an Episcopalian? Mm -hmm. No. 
How could it? How could it? It's just a fact. It's just a fact of nature. As everything else is. Everything is different and everything is relative. That's what one of the things that Einstein said. You can't get rid of it. But that in itself does not make breakthroughs. That in itself does not create significant literature or significant art. That's done by humans, period. Cats don't make art, as far as we know, birds, whales, they do their own thing, but as far as we know, we're the only things that make art. It's for us. It's from us and to us, and that's it. Because if you're not human, you don't make art. You have no use for it. You name, give me what, do you think microbes have a use for art? I don't know, but they probably don't. We're the only things we've ever run across that have any use for this at all. And, you know, that, that, that's why when it's good, it's really good, because it's really us. And when it isn't good, it isn't good. And all of it certainly is not very good. How could it be? Now, to say that there's a culture coming into being that is completely safe for mediocrity. Just look around you. But that doesn't mean it has to be that way. You know, the driving force of communications can certainly make the world look any, look any way it's presented and, you know, with a lot of frequency. And that's the world we live in. And it's a great world in that respect of communications, you know. Don't knock it. It's one of the great influences going into, like, uh, art. Not that you can create a cause and effect, direct cause and effect, but hell, it's a time we live in. Things move fast. Things are complex. Things are multi-layered. Things are confusing. That's okay. It is. And, uh, you, know, that, you know, that's, I guess that's always been like one of the strong driving forces of art. Just hear the complexity that goes in to the experience of a Bach, any piece of Bach, almost. You know, that, that's what an artist does who's gifted enough or stubborn enough to do it. It's very, it's very humbling to hear you speak. Yeah. It really is. It's a great pleasure. Were there, <clears throat> were there, were there, any, were there any other questions? Did we, were there any other questions? Nothing? All right. well, Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Thank you both. This has been a wonderful night. And Larry Poons, you are stellar. Thank you so much for your generosity. I didn't mean to be. Well, you're inspirational. Just live with it. Any fool can see that. Well, that's Brown. <laughs> Jason, thank you. You're very well. That was wonderful. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> next time I learned a little more every year. I just throw them in there. I'm assuming you're both going to want to take some pictures. Yeah. 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 Yes. And um, I wanted to get an, if I could get an extra take. David Ebony is thinking of taking segments of it out and publishing it in North America. Artists talk on art. We have no one on art. You do? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Whatever. And I'd like to. I mean, I. I think that it's important that um, we send like one to the archives of American art. I don't know if that's even. We can use anything like that. You know. I, I have a
relationship with them. With them. Uh, and they're in a whole different world now. Um, yeah, I contacted them, so it's, maybe I'll just make copies of mine. Stephen Pontari is Okay, uh, so you want, so I should make more copies. Yes, please, if you could. Um, one thing I'll be glad about this dress earlier is not having to make any more tapes. This may take so I might have Well, give me a master and I'll, I'll run some off. Yeah, yeah. I want to walk out with it. I want to walk out with it.